Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. I'd like to invite you to join me on a journey, a short visual meditation practice if you like. Imagine you were walking along a narrow beach path. The sea is down to your right and there are rolling sand dunes to your left with long sand grasses as far as the eye can see. As you are walking along this well-trodden path, you notice under your feet, you can feel the soft sand and occasionally the sand grass spiky at times between your toes. You walk carefully, taking in all that you can see. It is a warm day with a light breeze. You feel the sun on your skin and you breathe in the fresh air. You listen and you can hear seagulls and small birds and the sound of the wind and the sea. You feel a sense of peace that becomes stronger with every breath you take. Your focus is being drawn to the beauty of this place. And as you walk, you notice that your worries and thoughts drift away, allowing you to be fully present with where you are, to connect with your surroundings. You are drawn to watch the movement of the sea below you, and you can see the waves crashing gently along the shore. You get a sense of the power of the energy beneath each wave, the rhythm of the waves drawing in and out, the ebb and flow of the tide. The breeze drops and you notice the sand under your feet now has become softer and deep. You make your way towards the place to settle for a few moments and find a comfortable place to sit. You look out onto the horizon across the water, taking in the colors, the movement, and the energy. Perhaps choosing to close your eyes for a moment, allowing yourself to feel into your body as you breathe deeply, sensing into the movement that breathing creates. Feel your belly expand and your chest expand and stretch out your arms as you breathe in, increasing your connection with the space around you. Stretch up to the sky to feel the vast space above you. For a moment, see if you can keep your focus inwards, noticing how you are feeling in this exact moment, letting go of any expectations of how you should feel and simply be with whatever comes up without judgment. Bring your attention and your awareness to what is going on right now, tuning in with an openness, a curiosity and a willingness to be present. This short awareness practice was about shifting our focus from our imagined surroundings to tuning inwards, to sensing into the body and noticing how we are feeling and what we are thinking at the present time. This has set the tone for this talk, which is about enhancing our experience of being in nature by learning ways to be present and more aware. I'm a clinical psychologist and a yoga teacher and I'm learning to draw on my different trainings so that I can make the most 
of my time outside in nature and be more aware of my connection with my environment. I'm interested in what difference having a connection with nature makes. As a psychologist, I'm motivated to understand how we can improve our sense of well-being. What makes us happy? Motivated. What makes us satisfied? Spending time in nature is essential to my happiness. Living in Cornwall, I am lucky to say that I have had an abundance of nature on my doorstep, two coastlines to explore, hundreds of beaches. And growing up here, I've become drawn to being outside. There is a pull in me to be by the sea. And I've come to rely on my time outside as a way of bringing balance to my well-being, leveling out the heaviness and the thinking aspect of my work and I use it as a way of dealing with stress. There is a growing research body to show that being outside in nature has a measurable impact on reducing stress and enables us to feel calmer and content. There are studies showing that even looking out at nature at a group of trees from a window in a hospital room can speed up patient recovery time. Mental health services are developing surfing as therapy they have found that there is therapeutic benefit to being in the sea, immersed in nature. And I know this personally from how I feel when I'm outside. I feel a physical and mental health benefit. As an adult, I've become aware that although I spend as much time outside as possible seeking headspace, my mind is generally more occupied, less present, more headful with work, life and thoughts and it is harder to shift from focusing on my thoughts to enjoying my surroundings. Maybe you can relate. Have you ever noticed being on a walk in a place that is known for its beauty and before you realise it you look up and you've walked for a good 10 or 20 minutes without noticing the wildlife, the sounds, the colours as you've been so caught up in thinking. I notice this frequently. I'm prone to overthinking. I have an analytic mind, which in some ways has advantages and it means I'm driven to better understand things. And this is probably what led me to choose a career in psychology, where finding meaning and finding out what leads to behaviour change is at the heart of what I do. I've worked full time for the NHS for 16 years and I've trained in several therapeutic approaches to find ways to help people make sense of experience to provide a framework for understanding psychological distress. So to encourage new perspectives and ideas to emerge. So people can find ways out when they have become stuck. And in my work, I've learned about the way the brain deals with stress and how our whole physiology alters. We know that our brain cannot process all of the information we are exposed to from our senses, our conversations, reading, social media, the news, we are overloaded. And so the brain relies on certain cognitive heuristics or shortcuts designed to enable us to be more efficient with the vast amount of information. This is the brain's way of condensing and prioritizing. Our brain is selective about what it attends to. This is an efficiency strategy. It's automatic and it's very clever. However, it means that we are prone to having a skewed perspective and missing out on some information. We have an inbuilt negative bias. We are naturally drawn to information that may be indicating a threat. This is a biological safety mechanism. However, we know that this impacts on our perspective. Research has found that it is easier to embed a negative thought than to embed a neutral or a positive one. We need to work harder cognitively to process information that is not threat-based. We often run on autopilot, which is another shortcut. It means that we can easily predict how to behave and how others are likely to behave towards us by drawing on our memory of what has happened before. The downside, if we are too effective at this strategy, we end up missing out. We skim over information and only see what the brain selects as important, which tends to be negatively biased. 
as a psychologist and therapist, this is problematic, as if we are prone to being selective and biased, this is not helpful to the people we work with. We learn strategies to consider whether the information might be limited or skewed. This reflective practice helps us find ways of stepping back from our default mindset to gain a broader perspective. For example, in systemic family therapy, we use a team of reflective practitioners who sit in the room listening to the therapy conversation, and then they offer a different perspective, enabled by their unique position of being an observer of what's going on rather than caught up in the process, in the dialogue. I've become more aware of the times that I run on auto when my head is full, when I'm stressed. And this shortcut has become such a default that at times I do not take in the world around me. An example stands out when I was driving home from work. It had been a long day, back to back appointments, and the clinic room I was working from had no windows or natural light. It, it was winter and I was driving home in the dark and a long time had passed and I looked up and I saw an exit to the airport and realised that I'd missed my exit off the roundabout and driven for 10 miles before noticing. I was so caught up in thinking my mind had no room to be present. This was one of those moments where I decided I need to find some balance and I need to learn what to practice what I preach. The good news is we can change what has come to be our default mindset. Neuroscience terms neuroplasticity as the brain's ability to change its pathways and connections. Essentially, we can rewire parts of the brain and we can enable more awareness to thoughts and information. We can learn ways to manage stress by being aware of the physiological changes and by practicing strategies that calm our nervous system. Yoga and mindfulness are two practices that have evidence to show the parasympathetic nervous system becomes activated. There are changes in stress hormones, a reduction in adrenaline and cortisol, and the frontal part of our brain becomes more receptive. Mindfulness is a way to retrain the brain to move from autopilot to awareness mode and it can help us be more responsive of the environment. I'm learning that we cannot just think or sense make our way to greater well-being. We must learn by experiencing, practicing and feeling it, which has led me to train in more intuitive practices like yoga and mindfulness. Yoga teaches us to listen, to tune in to however we are, to become accepting and more compassionate towards ourselves, to let go of any unnecessary thoughts and to just be with whatever shows up on that day. It's not always easy to shift out of our negative bias and our autopilot. It takes practice and finding time to practice regularly is a challenge when we're busy and we're stressed. And I'll be honest, it's not been easy. This transition for me, <laughs> Though reassuringly, short practices like how we started this talk strengthen our neural pathway when we repeat them. This awareness muscle in the mind becomes stronger. And what has eased my transition to practices which are more about slowing down and tuning in was to connect doing them with something I love, being outside by the sea. It felt natural to me to take yoga practice outside. I trained as a yoga teacher in Costa Rica I spent six weeks immersed in wildlife, in nature, connecting with the elements, drawing on the senses, which just enhanced the whole experience of the practice for me. It took me far away from my own thoughts into the environment. It was perspective changing and it brought me into balance. And I didn't want to lose what I had learned from my time immersed in nature. And to simply come back to teach yoga at a studio and to return to full-time NHS work and drift back into autopilot. So three years ago, I decided to start an outdoor yoga class at my favorite beach in Cornwall. And this practice has now become an important part of my life and something I value for my own well-being. A community has grown of people that have connected with nature through practicing yoga outdoors and who have shown up week after week committed 
to keep it going through wind, rain, and all of the unpredictable Cornish weather. And being a psychologist, I'm keen to understand what has motivated this behaviour? What quality is it about the experience that leads to the discipline to commit, to set their alarm, make the journey, show up on time, time and time again? So I asked people who have joined an outdoor class to tell me about their experience. And I got over a hundred responses. So I decided to look at this as research. I pulled the data and drew out some themes. People talked about greater well-being, feeling happiness, connected with their emotions, feeling at peace, more calm, a precious bit of outside me time, this self-care. People talked about having a connection to nature, to something universal, more powerful, feeling a belongingness with this immersive experience that drew on the elements, feeling actively engaged with the environment and motivated by their surroundings. People talked about having increased awareness, this mindfulness aspect, feeling present, grounded, an opportunity to reset, to come back into the moment, to shift the focus from stresses and worries to come back and be present. People talked about a belongingness, something about this group community, a shared experience, sharing it with like-minded others. They talked about the safety and the reassurance of being with other people. Gratitude was something that came out of this. Feeling appreciative of the surroundings, of nature, feeling lucky to be here, lucky to be in this space. This outdoor yoga practice has taught me that the connection with nature is enhanced by community. When shared with like-minded people, who also have an appreciation of nature, it amplifies and it strengthens that sense of belonging. And if we consider the neurophysiology, the sense of belongingness and the safety of the group combined with the yoga and the mindfulness practice leads to the calming of the central nervous system. There is a chemical change in our bodies and oxytocin is released, which is the hormone that promotes love and bonding, enabling us to feel a sense of deeper connection with each other and with the environment. To have a felt sense that we are all one with nature. And that is what yoga means, unity. What has this told me about the behavior, the discipline, the dedication to a focused practice? Well, when you feel the benefit and then you repeat the behavior, it strengthens the neural pathways for that connection in the brain we are more likely to want to repeat it and to want to encourage others to do the same. The group has certainly motivated me to want to keep it going, even in the wind and in the rain. So what came out of a personal pursuit of me looking for ways to switch out of auto has evolved into something that has made me feel so much more appreciative of my environment. And I've noticed that people want to look after and protect the environment that they appreciate. I've seen people picking up litter on the way to the yoga class, no words spoken, just putting it in their pocket or bag, as if it's intuitive. And this makes sense, we protect what we love. And what I've learned is, if we can feel a deeper connection with our surroundings, whether that's through yoga or surfing or simply spending time outside, and do that with like-minded others, this increases a sense of belonging and an appreciation of our environment we are more likely to treat it with care and respect and want to protect it. I hope this talk has made you think about the time you spend outside and maybe it will inspire you to slow down, listen and tune in. Thank you. Hi. My name is Matt Vernon and I teach foraging all over Cornwall. I frequently get asked how did I get into foraging and I have to admit my answer does seem a bit odd at first but it will eventually hopefully make sense. I was very fortunate to come from a poor family. We didn't have a lot of money. My dad worked very hard but as a result he turned the whole garden over to fresh fruit and vegetables. I can remember going through and being able to pick strawberries and raspberries and peas straight out of the pod and 
seeing my dad's sweet corn going absolutely sky high. There was nothing that he couldn't grow. And then off the back of that, he saved up and bought a gun. And we used to go out shooting for our own wild meats, things like pheasant and rabbit and so on. And I've got these wonderful memories of being out with him shooting and then stumbling across a patch of seps, porcini mushrooms and gathering those. And we'd take home nuts and fruits and various bits and pieces. And my mum, who was this amazing home cook, would rustle up these wonderful meals from fresh produce from the garden, from things that we'd shot and foraged. And it's funny to think back as well, how I would go to school with clothes that had been stitched back together, hand-me-downs and trousers a little bit too short, but in my lunchbox, I had an organic pheasant and salad sandwich. But today I'm here to talk to you about climate change and foraging and how foraging makes us more aware of climate change. There's a few main points that I would like to go over with you and talk to you about. Firstly, how foraging gives us a reconnection with the natural world. Secondly, how we get immersed in it and we become part of nature as well. Then there's also the value of foraging and the value of the countryside around us. And then there's the issues of sustainability that concern a lot of people. And then finally, I'd like to talk to you about how foraging naturally makes us custodians of the countryside. I know the majority of people don't go foraging these days. But I'd like to ask you, have you ever picked a blackberry? Well, if you've done that, you've been foraging. We are all foragers. It's in our instinct. It's natural for us to do that. Now, I'm sure you've, most of you will have seen those heartbreaking images of a starving polar bear that can't range very far to get to its prey of seals and the like because of the melting ice sheets. But the problem with that is that's, for some people, that is happening the other side of the world. So climate change, the impacts of it, they're happening really far away or they're in the distant future and people don't really feel that it's a problem of theirs. But when you get into foraging and you, that becomes your focus, you become more aware of the effects of climate change on things like our seasons, which I've seen change dramatically over the years. Things like mushrooms, the mushroom season, the last few years has really fluctuated and really changed. Uh, it might start too early and not do very well or start late and finish too soon. And then there's other details you notice when you're out and about exploring your local habitats, things like birds nesting too early and then a sudden cold snap comes in and kills off their brood or their clutch of eggs. On one of my walks, there's a place we go to and I used to go and show my guests this beautiful plant. It's called sea holly. It's quite scarce. It was sadly over harvested by the Victorians. They had a love affair with it and they used to dig it up and candy the roots, I believe. And as a result, it's quite scarce and you don't see much of it anymore. So we didn't forage it, but we've gone to have a little look. The last few years, the, the winter storms have definitely got more extreme. And as a result, those patches of sea holly that I used to show to people, have, they've just been wiped out, they've disappeared. So just witnessing those changes in the seasons and in our weather here in the UK, it really brings home the damaging effects of climate change and how it is in actual fact on our doorstep. So when you go foraging, you become really tuned in to your local habitats. Things like a hedgerow that was once a blur of greens and browns, you start to notice the details, individual plants will pop out at you. And as you kneel down to gather various plants, things like common sorrel, you'll notice the little shiny beetles scuttling about the bright, vivid caterpillars with their patterns, the butterflies flitting around, and even other tiny details like the, the solitary minor bee that has its little burrows in banks of mud. I found it interesting that during lockdown, I had friends asking me, saying, now that we've put everything on pause for a moment, do you think that the birds are singing more? They're all coming out. And I was like, no, it's, it's not about that. It's the fact that you've slowed down, that you're starting to notice these things. You're starting to immerse yourself in your local habitats again. So, by going foraging, you're re-immersing yourself in your local habitats and in the natural world, which is where we belong. That's where we've existed for much longer than the way we are now. We've foraged for most of human history. It's only in recent times that we've relied on shops and supermarkets to get our food. If you see, curiosity leads to a connection. Regarding the value of our countryside, studies recently are starting to show that it's really good for ourselves to get out there. For our mental health, it's good to be out in the wild. Studies are calling it things like forest bathing is one of the terms that I've seen thrown around a lot. But for me, it goes a step further. When you go foraging, you're, 
you're really focused. You're looking at the habitat you're in. You're wondering what you might find there, what you might be able to pick and gather and harvest. And you get really caught up in the moment. For me, especially when I'm mushroom foraging, it's like, I just want one more sep or one more chanterelle. And whilst I'm doing that, my worries, they kind of just wash away. I'm not thinking about those things. I'm just focused and I'm there. I'm not thinking about the pile of dishes at home. I'm not thinking about the emails I need to answer or the bills that I need to pay. I'm just there finding my food. And there is another value as well to foraging. And it's a thought that can sit a little uncomfortable with some people. And it's the monetary value. Because essentially I am getting free food. I'm saving money on my bills. And I think the reason that this sits uncomfortable with some is the concerns of sustainability. But sustainability and foraging go hand in hand. One cannot work without the other. If you find something that you love to gather, that you love to eat, then you make sure there's enough left behind that it will regrow the next year. Because the thing is with supermarkets, when we go to the shops and we buy our food there, we know that those shelves will be restocked, they will be replenished. We don't have to worry about that. Whereas when you're foraging, you're thinking about how is this plant going to replenish itself? And the reasons, one of the reasons that supermarkets do this, they've got it down to a science, their sales techniques, is that they know that if a shelf is full and brimming with produce, we're gonna be more inclined to buy from it and potentially buy too much. And that I think is in part of the problem that leads to what is roughly around about 40% of food wastage here in the UK. So when you go foraging, you're supplementing your diet with wild foods. Studies have shown that our modern farming methods have been stripping our topsoils of nutrients. One study is suggesting we perhaps only have 60 years left of, of healthy topsoil. The other thing that's happened with our farmed foods is they've been bred to grow faster, to grow quicker, to a certain size, a certain shape and a certain color. But at the same time, these plants haven't been able to keep up the pace with absorbing nutrients from what is already a poor topsoil. Whereas forage foods, are far more nutritious. They haven't been tampered. They're specialists in their environment. In fact, there was a really interesting study done in, in the US where a group of botanists went out to forage in an urban env environment in a city setting. And the reason they did this was in America, they have these areas that are referred to as uh, food deserts where huge sprawls of, of, of suburbs where the only shops you can buy your food from are little convenience stores and they're basically stocking highly processed, overly processed foods and people struggle to get a good variety of fresh produce in their diet. So these botanists went out into the city centre and I believe they found around about five or six different wild edibles, things like dandelions and purslane. And when they got them back to the lab, they found that just washing seemed to be enough to remove the pollutants. They did say that more study needs to be done on that. But after testing, they found that aside from vitamin C, these wild foods were way more nutritious than kale and more drought resistant than kale. So by incorporating a little bit of wild food in your diet, you're boosting your nutritional uptake compared to what you're buying from the shops. Also, when you're gathering wild food, you are less reliant on these mass monoculture farms that are essentially stripping habitats. Your wild food, it hasn't been processed by machinery that's reliant on fossil fuels. It hasn't been shipped halfway across the country or halfway from around the world. I can remember, I think it was last year, right slap bang in the middle of uh, marsh samphire season, in the supermarkets, you could buy packets of marsh samphire that had been shipped over from countries like Israel and Turkey. And to me, that just made absolutely no sense at all. I say that these days we are filling our bellies, but we're not feeding our bodies. So thinking back to what we've been talking about, about our immersion in nature, our reconnection with it, about making it our second home. I'd like you to imagine for a moment returning to your actual house and finding that someone had destroyed your garden and fly-tipped in your front room and had poisoned your water supply. Would you not do everything in your power to track them down, to make them pay, to make them clean it up and, and potentially get them prosecuted for their actions? Well, that's how us foragers feel when we go out and we see the damaging effects of climate change that's messing up our seasons and destroying our habitats. We want to step up and we want to make changes and make a difference. So I would encourage you to do the same. Get a foraging book, go on a course, start to reconnect with your local habitats because foraging naturally makes you a custodian of your local countryside. And then that spills over into the wider community. So I would urge you to get out there 
enjoy your local habitats, appreciate your local countryside, become immersed in it and make it part of your home as well. Hello, my name is Ben Quinn and I'm a chef here in Cornwall. Pretty much a year ago, I was getting ready for my first TED Talk. It was in Brighton and um, I was massively nervous and to be honest, not, not much has changed to this one. That TED Talk followed the routine of a recipe. I mean, as you can imagine being a chef, that's exactly how my head thinks. The idea that you need a set of ingredients and you need a method maybe some conditions to do that within, and then ultimately end up with this, this aim. And my aim for that talk, and, and my aim as a, as a person, and my aim for my businesses, is to make lifetime memories. So that was the idea of that first TED Talk. I was gonna teach people my recipe for making lifetime memories. And I simply had the ingredients that I explained to be people, place, and purpose. People, obviously, those, those around you, some you may know, some you may not. A place, a place in time, but also geographically a place. And then finally, a purpose. So, you know, what do you live for? And if you can connect with those three, then you're able really quickly to identify when you're at a moment in life that you're going to remember forever. My purpose is to make lifetime memories. That was actually the aim of, of the recipe. And... I'm driven by finding those moments in time. All of my businesses and, and all of the things that I've gone on to achieve with my own life or with my businesses, I rate against that. Did I make a memorable moment? Am I gonna remember that forever? And the idea simply is that if I, if I do do that, if I do stay present and I'm able to recognize those moments, then I should be able to have more of them. And if I have more memorable moments, then I have a more memorable life. That's it in a nutshell. Since then, things have changed massively. The world is a completely different place. The ingredients for me are still very much the same and my aim is still very much the same, but the outcome is completely different. And today's talk is about me sharing with you how from a year ago to now, I still make lifetime memories, but where I make them and how I make them has changed massively. This year, reminds me of a moment in time that me and my team had maybe about three years ago where me and the team were in this beautiful location and we were smoking about 30 chickens for a really important dinner probably the most important dinner from the guests lives and these chickens were going brilliantly they were perfectly golden brown and they had like the hue of smoke that you'd expect they're sort of just slowly like dripping away and, and they're moments away from being taken off the smokers and resting. I turn my back for maybe two, three minutes and a complete disaster unfolds. I, I find out that there's been a flare up. For those that don't know about live, live fire cooking, that's simply where the fat drops on some charcoal or some hot metal and just catches fire instantly. So this situation's happening in front of me. There's been a flare up, there's a huge fire inside these smokers. And in there obviously are these 30 chicken and they're going from perfectly smoked to perfectly burnt in, in moments. So certainly that's what I'm thinking. So me and the team decide to react obviously quite quickly. And uh, the first thing we need to do is make the safe space. We just need to communicate quickly. We need to put the fire out and then looking to see if we could retrieve anything of these chickens. Next to me on the floor is uh, a bucket that is half full with cider vinegar and brown sugar. We use that to mop the chickens, um, to mop any meat or vegetables that we're, that we're cooking, to give them a certain zing or to build layers of flavor. So I've got that bucket there and, and I'm opening the barbecue and, um, and I'm basically taking the chickens out and I'm just putting them in it. I'm thinking these are ruined. I'm thinking what else can I serve? How else can I serve? So I'm doing that and then the team come round me and we look at these chickens and we realize actually it's not that bad. Actually they're, they're more than bad, they're, they're brilliant. They look perfectly fine, they're gonna be okay. Obviously we're all stoked, the party can go on. We remove the chickens from the brine and we put them on the roasting tins to be rested and, and we're getting ready to serve them. And then I take a moment with this bucket <laughs> and I just taste, just purely inquisitive, I just taste that brine in there, the cider vinegar, the brown sugar, but now it's got this incredible smoky flavor running through it. And straight away I knew that we've got to serve that, that's delicious. 
We use the same ingredients that we've used thousands of times and the same method that we've used thousands of times. We had a situation happen, a fret, and it changed what we were doing and it changed how we were going to serve these dishes. But actually what came out of it was this beautiful smoked gravy. And we served it over the chicken and the guests came back to us and said, look, that was the most delicious thing that they ever tried. They were using like bread at the table to mop it up. And um, yeah, I got stopped several times on, on my way leaving to be told that that was the most delicious chicken that they've ever had. And obviously I was massively relieved, but also massively proud. And from this day forward, the smoked gravy, that method, is something we use with all our cooking. So whether it's uh, meats or fishes or, or a lot of vegetables that we cook, we're always having a brine that we can sit them in, rest them in, and then serving back over. And it's a real positive that's come from a disaster. If you come and eat our food, you all taste the effects of that disaster. And this year is no different at all. If you come and eat our food now, you are going to experience what we've learned from our chicken day that has been this whole year. As a business, we've lost everything. We had to close, we couldn't do events, we had to lay people off, we had to cancel weddings. We've had a hard year, as we've all had. But what we did as a business is, rather than worry too much about the reality of the situation, is we started to look forward and to try and work out how we could approach this threat as an opportunity. So when COVID-19 struck in March and, and we went into a lockdown, we'd already closed our cafe because we felt like it wasn't the right thing to do to stay open. But we also were aware of the fact that people needed us now. Yes, we couldn't go where we were wanted, and that was terrible. We couldn't go to weddings and we couldn't go to festivals. But there are other people that we could connect with, other people in our community. We assessed what our skills were as a business. We were able to do big numbers. We can cook food for five, six, seven hundred people in the middle of nowhere. And we can do it to a restaurant level. We felt really proud of that, but we wondered how could we use that now? And the other thing we'd learned for opening Canteen in St. Agnes was that we worked out a way that we could offer good value food with good values. We were able to offer two things, one meat, one veggie or vegan, five pounds. And we were able to see a wider demographic, a larger community at a table. We were able to use produce that we were still proud of and we were able to serve that to a lot of people. So we had these skills and this experience, but we also had a connection in our community. We'd already started feeding the NHS. We did this over the Christmas of 2019. We laid our long tables in unusual locations in their hospitals and we asked their colleagues to vote for anyone that they worked with that they thought was doing a really good job and then we offered a place at our tables for them to sit, eat, take a moment, be with the people, be in the place and remember their purpose and make a lifetime memory that told them that they were heroes to their community. So I had a lot of positive connection in our local hospital. So I simply picked up the phone and I asked, can we help? And the answer was yes. <laughs> yes, please, please help us. Please help us feed our teams so that when they go into this pandemic, They've got the love and the support, but also the nutritional value that we can bring to them on a daily basis. So the first thing I needed to do to, to get that going was I needed to raise some money. So we set up a crowdfunder and within 24 hours, we'd pretty much hit our target. And by the time that crowdfunder had finished, we'd raised 30,000 pounds from our community to give to our community of NHS workers. We were also able to access funding from various other campaigns throughout the UK. Um, and we were able to set up systems very quickly to deliver huge quantities of food to our NHS workers, but never dropping our values and always staying good value, making the most of this funding that we've been given. By the end of 10 weeks of serving NHS frontline workers throughout Cornwall, we had fed over 25,000 of them. And it's this fact that I now take on throughout all my businesses. The big moment for me that I realised that our aim was still the same, all the way back to that moment on that stage in Brighton of that TED talk that I wanted to make lifetime memories. The big connection for that for me was an email that I received from a mum who had learned that her daughter, who was self-isolating in a local hotel, was able to connect with us through our food and feel supported and feel loved and feel part of a community and able to make a positive lifetime memory after quite hideous long shifts.
because of the, the food that we had, had, had brought to her. So that's when I realized that we still had the same aim. The ingredients still very much were the same, but the end result, just like Chicken Day, was this amazing realization that we could do this in a completely different setting. It didn't need to be weddings. It didn't need to be festivals. It could be in a moment in time that was every day and it could be in a complete disaster, a pandemic. Reflecting on all of that, I feel like the, the big idea, the idea that I felt was worth sharing with you is this idea that if we're gonna be environmentally sustainable, then we also need to look at being socially sustainable first. There is no point in my industry creating ingredients that only the richest people can afford and then telling people that it's those ingredients that are the most environmentally friendly. We must use ingredients that we can then make affordable. If we make food that's good for the planet affordable, then we're able to make it more socially sustainable and we're able to feed more people. If we continue to just feed rich people our food, then we will make absolutely no difference to the environment. It's this connection of good values and good value that is my idea. And this idea that if you're really good at what you do, if you really believe in what you do, just take a moment and ask, can I do this where it's needed and not just wanted? Thank you so much for listening.